So yeah, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Vlad Dramoliev and I am the uh, co-founder of Sofia Crypto Meetup. And uh, we have once again another event dedicated to blockchain and cryptocurrencies. I would call this event unique because we have Alan Farrington from uh, Bitcoin Magazine. <laughs> <Woo -hoo! laughs> Yeah, this is actually Alan's third crypto event ever, and I, I'm honored to, to have him tonight. After what? After, after, after the Bitcoin Conference 2020 and Bitcoin Conference 2021. So, uh, yeah, a real honor to have him uh, at Sofia Crypto Meetup. Today we'll be talking about Bitcoin, capitalism, money, philosophy, I guess, DeFi on Bitcoin, and I guess a lot of other things. Uh, so without further ado, thank you for coming and enjoy. I'm giving the word to uh, Georgi from Nexo, who will be leading this event and will be your host tonight. Together with me, I guess. <laughs> Georgi, there you go. Absolutely. Awesome. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> okay. Um, so my name is George, uh, and as Vladi said, uh, Tonight we have Alan, which, um, which is something really special. I think um, <clears throat> because uh, basically I've been in the crypto space for five years now. And uh, as guys, can we, can we keep you know, quieter? Thanks. Um, so I've been in the, in the crypto space for pretty much five years now. And, uh, you know, I've read a lot, I've listened a lot, I've, I've watched a lot. Uh, and there's very few kind of pieces of information that really, you know, leave a mark or kind of advance my knowledge in, in kind of like the space. And uh, Alan's uh, book and the book that he wrote together with Sasha is uh, by far absolutely the most advanced thing that I've personally come across uh, in terms of depth at looking at uh, Bitcoin in terms of, you know, not just looking at price, but, but looking at it at a way more fundamental uh, basis and looking at all the various implications that Bitcoin is going to have. Actually, not really talking so much about price at all, uh, which is why I'm super thrilled to have him here. I think this is a super special opportunity. And I hope you, we get a lot out of this event. Obviously, I wouldn't be able to do this. I wouldn't be able to meet Alan uh, if it wasn't for Nexo, if it wasn't for my job at Nexo. We basically met at uh, Miami for the first time uh, just, uh, just a month ago or so. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, just want to say, you know, uh, obviously, you know, uh, this event is uh, made possible by Nexo. Uh, the leading, the largest uh, digital asset institution, uh, you know, uh, globally, and obviously the largest company out of Bulgaria on the digital asset space. Um, as you guys know, we're we're talking uh, a, a lot about Nexo all the time. We keep growing, having uh, you know both retail and institutional businesses, as well as now advancing strongly into the DeFi space as well. Um, we keep hiring, we keep growing the team, and so. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you want to get involved in this, uh, in this really what is a renaissance, right? Uh, app actually, do, do, do reach out to us, do meet us, do check out the available opportunities um, and talk to us. But uh, having said that, uh, let's, let's tell you a little bit about the plan tonight. So uh, uh, we have basically three parts, I would say, of, of the event. First of all, uh, we're going to start by me reading the foreword of the book. Uh, that was written by Alex Gladstein, who is a uh, chief strategy officer in the Human Rights Foundation. And we're going to start with this because I believe, you know, what he's written and the way he has said it is um, um, just like lays the ground very well for the seriousness and scale of the conversation we, we, we're going to have here. Then we're going to have some uh, questions and answers. Basically, we're, be we're going to be talking with Alan, discussing, you know, capitalism, money, the capital renaissance that Bitcoin lays the ground for. And uh, we'll, we'll, the, the last topic we'll cover is going to be basically DeFi on Bitcoin, something that is not very popular, but uh, something on which uh, uh, Alan has strong, strong views on. Um, and eventually we're going to have like an open Q&A, obviously drinks, uh, and uh, we, we continue the conversation in a more informal environment. 
So, without any further ado, uh, I'll take a few moments to read uh, the foreword to the book. What if the year was 400, 1400, and you stood at the brink of the Renaissance, but didn't know it? What if someone handed you a magical book that would explain what the coming Renaissance was, reveal the injustices and inefficiencies of the medieval system, and foretell why and how things would change in the coming decades? What you have in your hands, dear reader, is a book that will do just this for you today, as we approach the Bitcoin renaissance. Humanity has potentially begun a historical transformation on par with the agricultural and industrial revolutions, and one with potentially an even greater impact. That may sound outlandish, but this book makes a compelling argument that it is, in fact, true. In the same way that medieval Venice set the stage for the peoples of Europe to break free of the empire and transition from serfdom to liberty and from financial slavery to financial sovereignty, today the Bitcoin network is the path to escaping the broken and unsustainable post-1971 political economy. In newspapers and on television, we're told not to worry about inflation, that, em that employment is a mere uh, it is more important than saving, and that we can own nothing and be happy. We should be satisfied, in other words, to work for those who own the assets, just as we watch their wealth continue to grow and concentrate, while we see the currency that we earn depreciate and see our way out of debt vanish. This book is a stunning rejection of this emerging new feudalism and its administrators. Over the past decade, governments, economists, and journalists have relentlessly hammered into the minds of the populations and audiences that Bitcoin is dangerous and risky, that it's for criminals, that it's a Ponzi scheme, that it's destroying the planet. Time, however, has shown that it has been dangerous and risky not to hold Bitcoin, which has been since inception the best performing financial asset in the world. But against the facts, Bitcoin users are still routinely told by authorities that their choice, opting peacefully into a new, fair, and neutral monetary system is wrong, immoral, and even treasonous. The reality, as the authors of the book argue, is that the world financial system is a cruel labyrinth, and we're all trapped inside, stuck in a situation where tomorrow is traded for today, where capital is strip-mined without consideration for the future, where our money is devalued by central planners, where our liberties are increasingly eroded, and where our behavior is spied on and used to engineer us to become more compliant and dependent. Bitcoin fixes this and helps us escape, but not by violence. It is not a sword for Theseus to fight the Minotaur, but a threat to follow to exit the labyrinth. And exit we shall. We, after all, owe the Minotaur nothing. Let the beast starve. We'll find our way out. The way is through a new kind of Venice in cyberspace available to anyone in the world, regardless of one's wealth, race, class, religion, gender, nationality, or occupation. Where any of the billions with internet access can connect to this revolution, be part of it, and even own a piece of it. That's what makes this revolution so much different from the ones that came before. Whereas those achieved change through hierarchical structures, Bitcoin will change the world through decentralization. As more and more people begin to realize that Bitcoin is monetizing right in front of our eyes, creating an alternative to the degenerate fiat capitalist system that we have been forced to partake in, we should feel no debt to the old regime of short-term thinking, top-down planning, consumption-driven spending, growth obsession, central banking, bailouts, rent-seeking, regulatory capture, toxic bigness, risk transfer, globalism, and financialization. Instead, we should turn our eyes to a future of long-term thinking, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, open-source architecture, nurturing, replenishing, risk-sharing, localism, and growing productive capital where the farmer plants his seeds 
instead of eating them and enjoys many harvests to come. To understand what is coming, we need a guide. There could scarcely be one better than the book in your hands. From the stunning realization one receives when reading chapter three, this is not capitalism, to the illumination provided by chapter five, the capital strip mine, the authors accomplished something extraordinary in the chapters ahead. These lucid and lively pages explore all the nooks and crannies of the impact Bitcoin will leave on the world, especially in regards to investing, communications, culture, energy use, environmental sustainability, and how we build our communities. In the book's crescendo chapter six, Bitcoin is Venice, we get a clarion call for a better future, more inclusive, less exploitative, filled with choice and reason and compassion. A financial system unrigged, unrigged with we, the people, at the controls. Digital gold, digital cash, and real property rights for all. Perhaps you found this surprising that a human rights advocate be asked to write the foreword to a book about finance and economics. But read the book and you'll understand why I've been tasked with, this, with preparing you for this journey. This isn't simply about money and finance and how it works, though you'll learn a lot about that along the way. It's a book about how we can and how we must harness the power of Bitcoin to secure liberty in the electronic age. Already as you read this, there are tons of mil tens of millions of people around the world who are peacefully opting into Bitcoin, not just in dictatorships and broken economies where 4 billion languish under authoritarians and 1.6 billion suffer under double and triple digit inflation, but in the West too. Even the most hardened skeptics are admitting that yes, Bitcoin has a use case somewhere. But why? Why do every day more and more people exit the existing financial system into something new? This book's explained the why. Individuals are leaving the old system of degenerate fiat capitalism, as the authors call it, and uh, as, as their money isn't theirs, and it's someone else's, and the real owners are abusing the money printer. This book is a guide to the system-wide effects of what happens when the money printer keeps going, when a preposterous global debt-to-capital ratio steals value from future generations, and, and when value is stealthily transferred from the have-nots to the haves. But it's also, more importantly, an inspiring vision for a better money laying the foundation for a brighter future. As crazy as it may sound, the authors will explain why this is not just a dream, and it's something that can, and likely will, as a result of a beautiful incentive structure be achieved. Most of the world just does not know it yet. I feel comfortable saying that this book will, vastly, uh, will be vastly more appreciated in five years, in 10 years, and in 20 years than today. It will age very well. Everyone else will get to appreciate it in due time. Today, you get a sneak peek into the future. Enjoy the ride, Alex Gladstein. Okay. <clears throat> cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that was obviously not me, but, um, but still, uh, I think, I think the, the text was super strong, so I, I really wanted to lay the ground. So, um, actually, I suggest we start uh, talking about you know, why what we live in is not really capitalism, right? Why what we live in is really uh, a capital strip mine? Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically I think a lot of what the book, like the, when the, the book was really started in a way was uh, in early 2020, right? March 2020, when COVID happened uh, and when, uh, you know, central banks uh, printed a lot of money out of thin air supposedly to, um, you know, prevent bad stuff from happening. Uh, but, you know, looking at kind of how things have evolved, generally, generally there hasn't been a collapse. So why do you, why do you and Sasha think, uh, you know, this is not capitalism? Um, and yeah, well, what's the alternative, I guess? Hmm, why is this not capitalism? Um, actually, before I answer, 
it's a very complicated question and there's two very long, dense chapters that don't even really answer it anyway. Um, I just want to say thank you to, to you, first of all, for setting this up, George. Uh, thank you to Nexo as well for putting it on. And thank you to all of you for coming as well. Um, this is a little overwhelming. I think it was said in the introduction. This, this literally is the third Bitcoin or crypto event I've been to. Um, but no one's ever asked me a question at the other one. So this is interestingly nervous for me. Um, and I need to correct your introduction, by the way, because yes, we met for the first time in person in Miami, but we met online because you did the Bulgarian translation of the Bitcoin standard, Standard Tut Bitcoin, of which I bought four for my Bulgarian in-laws. And then, I'm amazed you didn't make this connection to the book, by the way, because the very first, well, maybe not the very first thing, one of the first things in the book is a dedication to my new wife, which is written in Bulgarian, but I had to get George to translate it because uh, You can read it later if you want. But anyway, right, so why is this not capitalism? That was the question, right? I was thinking about that for the past 10 minutes. Um, okay, simple-ish answer, I think, is that if you are calling anything capitalism, and it's quite a vague word, right? It's quite a vague concept. People can mean many, many different things by it in the first place, I think. But if you are gonna call any system or society or economy capitalistic, you can probably, I think you need to admit up front, you can mean a lot of bad things by that, and I, possibly fairly so. It, I, I, don't, I certainly don't use it as a synonym for utopian or anything like that. But I think whatever you mean by it, even if you are being critical, you have to mean something like the respect for and the desire, maybe the incentive to grow the capital stock. And basically that's not happening at all right now. It, or well, it's not not happening at all. It's not the focus. It's where it does happen it happens locally and in a highly decentralized way, contrary to the highly centralized pressure to instead consume capital. Um, and I re even as I'm saying this, I realize that that all sounds very abstract. You can make this a lot more grounded though by just saying the, the, the very strong incentive is to consume rather than to save and having saved to then invest. Um, and that incentive is is driven by all sorts of things. I'm sure we're gonna get into this in a lot more detail. Ultimately, the inability to price capital in the first place because the price is set by the state. It's set artificially low in such a way that makes it seem like you can consume more than you can. And ultimately, actually, what it really means is it seems like you can consume more than has in fact been produced. And so people, well, you, you can't actually do that, but they try to do that. They think it's reasonable to do that, and all the information, all the economic information that they're getting tells them that that's gonna be okay, and then all of a sudden, it's not. And we get March 2020, which was, as you say, was uh, in the week or so after that happened, that's when Sasha and I sat down and, and wrote, this is not capitalism in response to it. Because at the time, the vast majority of the media coverage was, even when it was, um, it, it almost didn't matter whether it was favorable or, or highly unfavorable. It was commenting on what was happening as if that was capitalism. And so, you know, our argument is no, it's absolutely not. And, and just as a quick follow-up question. So basically you described this, uh, this stage from March 20 to, uh, to, to today as kind of the final stages of degenerate fiat capitalism. So do you think basically the nail is in the coffin? How, how far are we? I think probably yes, but only because of Bitcoin. I think if Bitcoin didn't exist as a, as like a life raft, the debt would just be monetized and we'd start again. I don't think I really need to say more than that. That's the, um, yeah, it's over. It's, I mean, it might take a very, very long time, but the, the way we put it in the book, the, um, the part that you're referring to, I think is the, the the, the first few sentences, certainly the first few paragraphs is that, of this is not capitalism. I think people will look back on, on that moment in the way that we rhetorically highlight as, oh, that was clearly when it started to end, yeah. Okay. 
All right, let me remember what I have on the slides. Yeah, actually, uh, based on this, so I've, I've picked some quotes here from the book uh, that I found particularly strong, although it's been hard because there are so many of them. <laughs> um, but uh, having said that, so I want to I wanna continue the conversation on something that you mentioned uh, previously. And I want to, basically, you said we're not building capital, right? We're destroying it, is what the system is currently doing. But to make it more tangible, I want to give an example by, basically, you're stating in the same chapter three that uh, GDP, you know, gross domestic product, what we all as society, community, like on TV, in school, uh, we all say like, yeah, G GDP must grow up, and so we become wealthier, happier, whatever. Um, but you're making this argument that uh, this is not the right metric to measure an economy's growth and well-being. Um, why so? And, and if not GDP, what else should we measure? I actually might not be able to answer this fully because there's so many things wrong with GDP. I might not remember all of them. Um, I think the most important one, we talk about a few points at, in, in that section of the book. Um, the most important one, I think the one that you're getting at, is that it's not a growth rate in the first place. Like a, a, People often talk about it in this very casual way where, you know, because it's a percentage, I think, I don't think they think about it much more than that, because it's a percentage, they think that it, it's fair to call it growth. But growth actually means something a lot more technical than just a change, which is what this is. So what GDP is actually telling you is effectively the change in aggregate revenue of a, of a country. Usually people talk about GDP in, in, as, as reflecting a country. Um, and apologies, I need to use a little bit of financial jargon here. Apologies if you don't follow this. It's not that complicated. It's just kind of industry stuff. Um, it reflects revenue. And What's kind of amusing about that, what Sasha and I were picking up on is something that bugged us in our jobs at the time anyway, that people in finance do the same thing. They talk about companies in that case, not, not whole, or usually not whole uh, countries, economies. They talk about companies as growing when their revenue goes up. And that's, that's just wrong. It's a misuse of this term. That's, again, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's probably a good thing, but it's an increase. And it's maybe easier to understand in the case of a company, actually, and then I'll go back to a country. So if a, if a company's revenue is going up, but they are loss-making, they will run out of funding. They will deplete their capital, and they will go bankrupt. And it doesn't matter how high their revenue got in the meantime. They didn't create any value. They destroyed the entirety of the value of the funding they were ever given. So the proper way that you measure growth with a company is return on capital, which is a little bit more involved. So first of all, you don't care about revenue because revenue doesn't count costs. And in particular, this is really relevant when we get onto a country, it, I mean, it doesn't count any cost at all, but it doesn't cost depreciation, oh, sorry, it doesn't count depreciation and it doesn't count interest, which is basically ignoring that things wear down and ignoring um, as in ignoring that your capital stock wears down and ignoring that taking on debt has a cost which is both are like highly, I don't know, fiat attitudes. So you don't look at revenue. You, first of all, you look at income, and then you need to look at the ratio of income to capital, which is return on capital. Um, and the reason is that what that tells you is how much can the company get bigger, which could be reflected in revenue growth, but how much can it get bigger sustainably, right? So how much can it get bigger, or how fast can it get, get bigger, say, on its own because it's doing something, because it is actually creating value as opposed to you know, the company that's revenue is constantly going up but it makes a loss and eventually it goes bankrupt. So with a country, it's very similar. GDP is revenue. GDP growth is the increase in revenue from one year to the other. And it doesn't matter in the meantime what has happened to the capital stock of that country. It doesn't matter if all of the, uh, let's make it a bit more tangible, like factories, say. That's, I think that's a classic example of like tangible capital employed. It doesn't matter if all the factories are breaking, they're all you know, wearing down and you're having to go out of business. Um, it doesn't matter how much interest you're having to pay on debt, so it doesn't matter how much of that revenue isn't itself sustainable in the first place. People are just, I think it's in one of these quotes, right? People are just consuming on credit. None of that matters at all to GDP. And I think the last thing you said was, what should we count? We should count something like return on capital, but for a, a country, I guess. 
And it's maybe a nice point to end on how sad all of this is because there isn't a word for that. I had to explain everything. I just talked for like five minutes to get to the point of saying we should care about return on capital for countries, shouldn't care about GDP, but nobody even knows what to call that, which is kind of sad. But there you go. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, like a very good example I, I think would help people understand here in the book uh, was this example where you have two guys, right? One guy is earning 200,000 a year, the other guy is earning 20,000 a year, right? And so normally you would say, okay, the guy who earns 200,000 uh, is probably better off, right? Um, uh, but when you add to the fact that... just read this, because it's not from us anyway, it's from another book. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, it is. Okay, we can read it, yeah, okay. So uh, imagine for a moment two people, Bill and Ben. Bill is a banker, earns 200,000 uh, a year at Goldman Sachs. Okay, he's... Uh, miserably paid by banking standards, but uh, bear with me. Uh, ben is a gardener and earns $20,000 uh, just trimming roses, basically. Who's better off? Obviously, you would say the guy who earns, uh, you know, 200K is better off. Now, if you measure the income levels each receive, then Bill is clearly richer. In fact, precisely 10 times richer. This measurement is the equivalent of GDP. It tells you about the flow, the income that the guy has, right, every year. But just like GDP, these numbers don't reveal much about the true wealth of Bill and Ben. To discover more, you would need to know more about their stocks of assets. So not just the flow, not what they have, right, what they earn every month or every year, but, um, but what do they have set aside already? I forgot to mention that Ben, the gardener, recently inherited a huge countryside estate worth 100 million. In truth, he works in his own vast garden, a bit as a hobby, on Tuesdays, um, and uh, the salary really doesn't matter much to him. But he plans to sell off the estate next year, move into somewhere uh, more modest, and leave off the interest from investing $95 million. Poor Bill, meanwhile, is up to his neck in debt he has to fork out half his salary each month on his mortgage, which has another 10 years to run. He has car payments on his scratched up Porsche and troubling bank overdraft that he's acquired to maintain his uh, high flow, this is a complicated word for me, <laughs> lifestyle. Um, and so basically, you know, I, I like this because it's, it's like if you look at, you know, this guy, okay, he earns 200K, but he's so deep in debt that he's close to bankrupt, if not already bankrupt. And if you look at so many countries out there, including obviously the United States being the largest, sure, there's so much uh, GDP, GDP is growing, but essentially the debt is so high that all these folks, they're essentially bankrupt, right? Um, and, uh, but, so, so, what are your thoughts on this or, or, or? <laughs> Like that is bad. I don't like that. <laughs> uh, I thought of actually um, probably a far simpler example than going through all the financial statement nonsense. And it was alluded to in Alex's introduction because he's obviously reflecting that we talk about this in, in chapter five, which is what, where most of this is coming from. Um, you can just think of a farmer, right? which is, the nice thing about this example, by the way, is it's not really like an analogy. It is completely true. It's a farmer is an economic agent and the farm is capital and the harvest is revenue and so on. A farmer can always boost his consumption. That's another way of thinking about like what revenue is actually measuring, just consumption, not whether it's sustainable or not, or you know whether you can afford it in the first place or not, just did you do it? Farmer can always boost his consumption by eating the seeds rather than planting them. And that is just so obviously an incredibly stupid thing to do, I guess, unless you know he's starving. But the point is, he's not starving. All he wants to do is boost consumption. Um, and that, that is perfectly paralleled in, in basically everything that we have been talking about, just in a, in a far, far more complicated form that what it, whoever the actor is doesn't care about maintaining the value of the assets they own and their own productive capacity for the future. They just want to consume right now. And it's silly. It's not a good idea. I guess as a follow-up question, um, 
So you're basically saying in the book that instead of destroying capital, we should really be growing, nurturing uh, capital, right? Is this even possible in the fiat system? Ah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, uh, it is possible, but it's, it's made much, much more difficult. I think that's probably a, a fairer way of assessing the fiat system, if you want to call it that, rather than just saying, oh, it's horrible. Because you, you remember I corrected myself earlier by saying, uh, there are people who are creating capital. There are people who are creating wealth. They're just very much removed from the state, basically. Uh, they do their best to ignore the mispricing of capital. Um, and I think the really sad thing is that this is maybe a good segue into discussing how Bitcoin relates to all of this. The really sad thing is that it's the the incentives you face in the fiat system are completely unnatural. It's almost obvious that they're unnatural because I'm glad I brought up the farmer example. Like, no farmer wants to eat their seeds. They want to plant them. Like, it's not a confusing concept. Um, and it's, it's part of most um, kind of folk wisdom, I guess you could call it, that you, know, you shouldn't consume on debt. I mean, until relatively recently in basically all of human history or all of Western cultural history, let's say, it, it was well established and understood that you shouldn't really get in debt at all if you can possibly avoid it and that's gone completely out the window over the past 30 to 50 years say so it's the fiat system itself that creates these perverse incentives basically by removing any negative feedback from bad decisions uh, and also in a there's maybe two parts so one is that you don't get the feedback that would make you stop like you know the farmer would then have a tiny harvest next year because he ate all the seeds and he'd think oh that was stupid i won't do that and then it's also political as well so the the bad consequences are socialized to so you're you're maybe even getting the consequences that you didn't cause yourself um so it's highly highly unnatural uh and um I think that's, that's maybe very hopeful. I've, I've probably sounded pretty depressed for most of my answers so far. But the, uh, the hopeful approach is that it's uh, realizing it, it can be better, and I think hopefully it will be better. Okay. So let's then move towards more towards um, Bitcoin. By the way, I just saw this today as I was preparing the slides. It was like a super um, recent thing which reinforced what you been saying all along here that uh, in the US basically we're seeing an uh, excessive amount of debt and uh, you know record low savings so I guess this would really mean you know destroying capital at the fastest rate possible ever right yeah. which is sad but it is what it is um, okay so moving on to to the concept that you have the so-called uh, Wittgenstein money and I'm going to read here, so I have my uh, notes, my pishtof, because you know I wanna wanna ask good questions, and I can't necessarily always ask them on the fly. Um, so, question is: Is Bitcoin money? And most people, you know, um, most people would say it's not, because it's too volatile. It could not possibly be used as money. And generally, Bitcoin does not fit economists' definition of money, right? It can't be a store of value because it has no intrinsic value. It's just, you know, something out there. It can't be a unit of account because it is too volatile. It can't be a medium of exchange because it is not widely used to price goods and services. Obviously, you have a different view, but, but why and how can you say Bitcoin might be money? I'm saying it, it might be money. And, and why, you know, since it doesn't fulfill any really of these... Uh, of these criteria. So shortly after that point in the book, we introduced this basically sarcastic concept of the semantic theory of money, um, which is that you can know what money is from an armchair, basically. You can, you can just have a definition of it, and then if you have a candidate money, you just check it against the definition, and then it either is or it isn't. And crucially, you don't care and hence you don't investigate how people are actually using it. Um, and you know, I'm saying this is sarcastic because no, no advocate of, I guess, fiat money or no critic of Bitcoin would admit to that being their attitude about money. Um, but it's very readily evidence. Like it's very easy to find people falling into this and in their criticisms of Bitcoin. So I honestly think the most important thing 
to start off with is just to reject this framing. You know, don't, you, not, not that you should like think that these, so the, the criteria just for everyone's reference are, or the typical criteria are store of value, medium of exchange and unit of account. I'm not suggesting these are completely pointless or meaningless or you should just discard them. I am suggesting you should investigate what is actually happening in the real world. And it's something that, I don't know if, if people are familiar with, um, obviously Alex Gladstein wrote the foreword to this book, which is very kind of him, um, but I strongly, strongly encourage you to basically read everything else he has ever written. And he has his own book now, which is a, a compilation of essays that were on Bitcoin Magazine. I think it's called, do you remember, is it Check Your Financial Privilege? Yeah. Um, strongly encourage people to read that because what he does is absolutely amazing. I mean, he's, his real job is a human rights activist, but he's probably one of the best journalists on Bitcoin that there is, or at least that I'm aware of. He just goes out into the world and really investigates how people are, are using it. And it never occurs to him to, you know, get a textbook or get a, like a blackboard or something and, and try to work out whether or not Bitcoin is money. His experience, or rather his reported experience of others, makes it completely obvious that it's money and that this entire semantic game is just a waste of time. Uh, so that's, I think that's important to get out of the way. That, that way of thinking about it is a complete waste of time. Okay, so it's not money by the definition of the establishment, mm. but in reality, people use it as money, so it must be money. Sure. All right. I'm happy with that. Okay. Yeah, now I have my favorite question. So, and I know it, it has, in the past few days, you've, oh. you've been very active on this one. Um, so, you know, I have this, uh, I, I get this so much, so many times uh, with, with people when I talk about Bitcoin and that there's only 21 million, right? It's never, mm. supposedly not going to be more. And people are like, but how can the economy grow when, uh, you know, the money supply is fixed? You know, we need to have inflation. Uh, you know, not a huge amount of inflation, but 2% uh, is kind of like the, this widely agreed upon uh, number that we should have, and that's healthy. Is this really healthy, and is, is deflation bad per se? <laughs> no, it's not healthy. No deflation is not bad. Um, I, I struggle to really answer this, um, I guess, in general. I'll, I think I'll do a better job today because of what's happened on Twitter in the past few days, so I've been... I've been well primed, but I th the reason I struggle is that it's such a silly idea that I don't even, re like I don't know why people believe it in the first place, so I'm not sure what it is I'm supposed to debunk. And I asked on Twitter the other day, I finally snapped on this, uh, not on um, is deflation bad, although that's kind of implied, um, but where does this 2% inflation number come from? Because you hear this all the time, I'm sure everybody here has heard this at least once, probably tens if not hundreds of times, that you know, a lot of inflation is bad. They will at least admit that. Uh, deflation is really bad though. No inflation, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what their opinion on that is, but probably also bad. A low number, like a single digit number for inflation is good. Like that's healthy, that's optimal. And I wanted to know where this came from because I, just, it's, it seems like almost a meme in its own right. And I think the answer, uh, quite a few people posted the same link from uh, Mises.org, uh, where someone else said it, like an actual journalist had investigated this question. And I, unfortunately, I don't remember the exact answer, but it's like, the details don't really matter. It's the, the sort of the core premise that is funniest, which is that a central bank literally just made it up as a public relations move. So, and I think it was maybe the New Zealand Central Bank, I wanna say at some point in the 80s, uh, they were experiencing very high inflation, or relatively high, because there's always inflation in fiat. Um, and they came up with this PR campaign to um, basically legitimize themselves in the eyes of the public by saying, okay, it's like 10% or whatever it was now, but we're gonna get it to two, because two's good. And they never justified, like there's no, there's no equation that this pops out of. There's no actual reasoning that contributes to this answer. Two is just less than 10. There, there is, man. Like me, people would say that if there's, if there's no, uh, you know, even small inflation, people would just hoard money. They would never spend it, right? And so when yeah. they don't spend it, uh, you know, companies, they would not sell shit. And so uh, they would not have revenues and they would fire people and then we would enter a recession. That, that's, you know. No, we'd all starve and die. It would be a lot worse than that. No one would do anything, yeah, if they weren't, um, if they weren't stolen from, I guess. 
Uh, yeah, there's a couple of ways of addressing this. Well, one thing is I was really, I think I could, this came up in conversation with you the other day. I finally found a good, like quite quick rebuttal to this, I think, or maybe not a rebuttal exactly, but just a way to get people to think about it, which is that what that argument, what that is basically saying is that if, you know, you, the, oh, sorry, the audience, um, if it didn't take you 2% longer every year to do stuff, to like achieve things in your day-to-day -day life, if it didn't, then you wouldn't ever do anything because you just wait. You need the threat of it taking 2% longer in a year to be motivated to do it now. That, that's literally, that's how stupid this is. That's why I struggle to debunk it. Like I don't know why people believe that in the first place. They don't believe what I just said, but they believe something that means exactly the same as what I just said. Um, the more general point about whether deflation is bad though, yeah, this is really interesting. I'm not gonna give a thorough answer on this because I would probably end up talking for about 30 minutes and still not really answer it. But there is one quite funny thing I wanna say, which is that I'm very grateful to Michael Saylor, I'm sure everyone knows who that is, the CEO of MicroStrategy, um, for coming up with a great uh, kind of meme almost, like a good, really handy bit of rhetoric to describe this. Um, he wasn't talking about deflation at the time when he said this, I think. It was on a podcast about a year or two years ago. I think he was talking about inflation. Yeah, he was talking about why CPI makes no sense. Um, I won't give that explanation now, but he called it a metaphysical abstraction, which I love for this. And it's it, the same, it works as well as an insult for, for criticizing um, people who don't want any deflation either because their concern is, in my opinion, is based on a metaphysical abstraction. So they, to link it to the, you know, the reasoning you just gave about why if we had deflation, we would then all starve and die because no one would do anything. Um, people who propose this have zero conception of causation, basically, and, and of time to some extent too, in that they, they seem to think of deflation and inflation as well, but deflation in particular, as being this kind of metaphysical force. It's like a, a pressure almost that exists in nature and makes prices go down. And they don't think at all about why prices would go down. And the reason is basically, as links nicely to, it's the, the opposite, I guess, of all the capital strip mining. The reason prices go down is because of capital accumulation. Becoming more, people putting effort into becoming more productive rather than consuming. That's just like a kind of overly simplistic way, I guess, of saying investing. That's what you do when you invest in a very general sense. You're putting your effort towards being more productive in the future rather than now. That is the only reason that prices would ever come down in the first place because entrepreneurs do that, right? They invest, they accumulate capital. They are then in a position to lower their prices maintain their returns, again, back to returns that matter, not revenue, maintain their returns, but actually probably increase their returns by gaining market share. What I just said, the past like 15 seconds of me speaking, is why prices change. It's always and everywhere why prices change and is why there would ever be any deflation if there wasn't a kind of contrary inflationary force in the money supply in the first place. And so if people just stopped doing things because they were waiting for you know it to be cheaper next year or whatever, then things would stop getting cheaper. And again, this is like really, it sounds stupid when you have to explain it like this because it is incredibly stupid, but it's, um, it's always packaged with so much more jargon than that, I think. So, so much, it's packaged in such a way that you are strongly discouraged from thinking about what this means in real life. So you can't realize things like the insanity of not doing things now because it'll take you 2% more time in the future or whatever. Like when you actually think through what causes these things, it's just so incredibly silly. And obviously deflation is good because what that means is it's gonna take you less time in the future. You want it to take less time. That's obviously a good thing. Or in other words, you know, stuff gets cheaper, which I generally like. I don't know about you, but it's, I like when Bitcoin gets cheaper? I, man, man, a lot, but not just Bitcoin. Like, because Bitcoin is not consumption, right? They don't, they don't ah, talk about right. consumption. So, like, uh, Bitcoin doesn't produce anything, right? Um, yeah, they like to say that, don't they? Right. Um, but, but the thing is that, um, you know, um, 
also the thing is that you would consume even if it gets cheaper, right? Because like you want this phone, like you're not gonna wait for the phone for five years to get cheaper. You want to use it now. You need to work, right? You want to get the job done. You want to build a building. You're not gonna wait five years to build your home simply because in five years it will be 5% cheaper or whatever, right? You, you want to live because your time here kind of, you know, ends. Um, so, okay. Good stuff. So let's let's move to the to the Bitcoin is Venice part. Uh, how is Bitcoin similar to Venice? Um, and and actually, you know, maybe maybe we can start by by um, kind of like understanding more about why do you see this uh, this world that we live in today as a neo feudalism, right? Mm. Because I would say if you ask the average person, if you ask the average politician, the average you know just in general anyone, they would say we live in the freest society ever. The most advanced society, and yet you are comparing our society currently to kind of like the late Middle Ages or something. Yeah. So why is that? Because what bothers me is not the aggregate amount of wealth, but rather, which obviously is is so many orders of magnitude greater than in the late Middle Ages that is this would be quite silly to seriously compare them. Um, but the state of the average person with respect to all of that wealth. Uh, so without sounding too much like a, I don't know, Occupy Wall Street kind of neo-Marxist-y type, um, it, I mean, it's just, it's just a fact. It's not like a political point. It's just an observation that um, wealth inequality is getting worse and worse and worse every... I mean, it's basically, by any sensible metric of it, it has gotten worse every single year of my lifetime. And so as to distinguish myself from the neo marxist types, uh, I don't think that's bad in and of itself, but given that part of the cause, at least, I would argue the main cause is fiat, it's the way that the monetary system works, that is bad, and hence I do also object to the, the inequality. So even though there is this incredible amount of wealth relative to this prior period of, of you know, feudalism rather than neo-feudalism, um, the average person has, I guess, alarmingly little capacity to take advantage of it. Um, basically because they are so incredibly in debt that they they may not literally have a, a, a lord, I guess. They may not literally be a serf. But in economic terms, they're very close to that because the only thing they can afford to do with their time is work as much and as hard as possible to pay off their debt that they, they probably never will. And then also just to link it as well to a point that you made before, this is compounded by the kind of degenerate culture that accompanies this, which gives them contrary incentives. So it, it encourages them to actually just keep on, you know, keep taking on more and more debt, and in particular to consume on this debt. Whereas arguably even, ideally you wouldn't be in that position in the first place, but if you end up in that position, the most sensible way out of it, I would argue, would be to do your best to invest. You want to create a stock of capital that you actually own that will itself be productive and will help you escape debt with something other than your own time. So that's that's kind of what I mean. And and just uh, as a final note on this, if anyone is interested, um, most of the commentary, I mean, it's only like a few paragraphs or so in, in that chapter, but most of the commentary there is from a book, a, a really, really good book, I think, called uh, The Coming of Neo-Feudalism by Joel Kotkin. And so we reference him quite heavily, not just in this chapter, um, but that's where that, I, I didn't come up with neo-feudalism, just to be clear. All right. Um, so, so let's continue about Bitcoin is Venice. Um, why, why is Bitcoin Venice? Why do you compare oh, Bitcoin okay. to Venice? Yeah, and then feel free to share why is, um, I didn't know this, but I guess it's a what Greek, it? yeah. Greek uh, god or... Someone from the audience might need to correct me. I don't think Ariadne is a god, but it is a Greek myth. All right, we'll come to that in a minute. Why is Bitcoin Venice? Um, it's not remotely serious. Just first and foremost, please don't um, think that I think that it's a highly uh, romantic metaphor, I guess. Um, 
the connection is quite spurious, but I think it's quite cute as well, which is that um, in not only medieval Venice, but actually up until around 1800 or so, due to the state of military technology that entire time, Bitcoin was, uh, sorry, Bitcoin. Venice was <laughs> extremely easy to defend and extremely difficult to the point of basically just being impossible to attack. Um, and the consequence of this, or one of the more obvious uh, good consequences, is the flourishing of all kinds of activities that you require peace for. Uh, so first of all, commerce, but then the, with the, the excess wealth generated from commerce, uh, explosion of cultural activity that we now call the Renaissance. Um, and so the connection to Bitcoin is hopefully fairly obvious, having established that, um, that groundwork that the cryptography that, I don't know, I don't want to be too technical about it, but you know, makes Bitcoin work, let's say, is, um, is very cleverly constructed in such a way that likewise, Bitcoin is very, very expensive to the point of basically impossible to attack. Um, and equally, although it means something kind of subtly different, it's very, very cheap to the point of basically free to defend if you know how to use it properly. Uh, and so the hope, this is kind of the, the, this is what Alex was getting to in his introduction, is that that will provide a similar starting point to what in the case of Venice is just kind of a geographical coincidence, um, but that will encourage, uh, first of all, peace and everything wonderful that follows from that, commerce, culture, et cetera. That would be really nice. For sure. Um, all right, so uh, I've taken this quote because I, I, I really like it. And uh, I, I really loved how you describe it. And I don't think people actually realize it and think about it. Um, I'm sorry, sorry, I can't see it, so I can't read it. But does any, anyone really believe that having fully understood the choice they face, any individual would choose to self in self-referentially mispriced toxic loan rather than a provably sound digital bear asset. Can you explain, like, talk a little bit about, you know, Bitcoin, the digital asset, mm -hmm. and why it would make sense for anyone? Because you're saying it makes sense to hold Bitcoin as opposed to fiat, which, you know, this piece of paper, you're basically saying, what was it? It's a mispriced toxic loan. Yeah. So that's kind of an unfair quote to take out because this reference is something that we talked about many times in a previous chapter. But just to explain this, um, this is kind of an insult. Like it's, it's more cheeky than it is accurate, but calling fiat a self-referentially mispriced toxic loan. So what I'm referring to there is that the way new, or the main way new fiat money comes into existence is when banks, when commercial banks make loans. Um, it's interestingly not when central banks create new reserves. That does obviously happen, but that's quite a small minority of, you know, like the quantum, I guess, in absolute terms of new money that is ever created. It is important, though, because that the existence of that function enables commercial banks to do this in the, I guess, inherently reckless, um, yeah, reckless way that they do. Um, so... My suggestion is that because commercial banks create new money by issuing loans that do not need to, well, aren't backed in any meaningful sense, but more importantly, aren't even really incentivized to be priced properly or lent well at all, because the existence of the central bank ability to create new reserves means that they will always be bailed out, right? They're the existence of a lender of last resort is um, it's, a, it's a moral hazard that means that they can actually make terrible loans and it doesn't matter. So most money comes into existence as a basically bad loan. So I'm using this uh, kind of cheeky insult, calling it a toxic loan, which technically means a loan that you know is bad, but you know I'm just calling it like probably not a great loan. Um, and then self-referentially mispriced. So the idea here is that once upon a time, this process would have been actually backed. It would have been at least partially reserved, or well, fractionally reserved. Originally, it would have been fully reserved with gold. Then it moved to only being 
fractionally reserved, and now even that basically doesn't mean anything um, because there's no there's no peg anymore. But what that does is that it meant a huge amount when it was backed by gold because that was how everybody was conceiving of the price of it. Whereas now there's nothing it's pegged to, and hence it's only really priced in terms of itself. Uh, not as in the loan is priced in terms of its own loan, but the entire monetary system, like every unit of money is this, and it only makes sense to price it in terms of this. So, sorry, I kind of need to, I need to get through all of that so you know what I'm insulting here when I call it self-referentially mispriced toxic loans. Um, and then obviously it's a much easier, I won't take anywhere near that much time describing Bitcoin because absolutely nothing I just said applies, right? It's not, it's, this is interestingly actually used as a, a dunk, but it's, kind of, it's more of like a cell phone when people say it's not backed by anything. Um, that's a good thing. It, it is, you know, it is the backing. It is actually equity, whereas every other form of money is a liability, but it's a liability that's priced in terms of itself. Um, and then maybe the final link, I didn't actually mention this with the blah, 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 toxic loan, is in fiat money, you, what you actually own to the extent you even own it in the first place is a bank liability. Um, I focused on the liability side, but actually being clear on the fact that it's the bank that owns it. You just have an IOU from the bank. You don't actually own anything, really, which is not that interesting in economic terms, but it's really interesting and important, and again, Alex alludes to it in the, in the foreword, um, it's really important in social terms because that's where the sensorability comes from. That's why people's money can literally be turned off, especially as it gets more and more digital because it's the bank that has control of it in the first place. And whenever you make a payment, you're basically telling the bank what to do with your IOUs from the bank. And so again, obviously Bitcoin doesn't have this at all. It's a bearer asset. Um, when you send it, you don't have to ask anybody for permission. Uh, do you think people understand this? Um, no. that, that basically the <laughs> money they have in their bank, it's not theirs, it's just some digits right there. Um, and like, not just people, but because people, okay, like everyone has his small savings, but companies like uh, large countries. Personally, you know, when I saw what happened with Russia and the Russian Central Bank a couple of months ago, I was like, whoa, that's, that's super bullish for Bitcoin because mm -hmm. people finally understand that what they own is a liability, is not an asset, and, and they don't really own it, uh, right, in the first place. But, uh, okay, that happened, and, you know, it's, I'm not sure, but it's as if, you know, the, the old story kind of goes. I don't know. Like, what's your, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think people understand? Like, this was a large event. Yeah. A lot of money basically was, uh, yeah, like a large amount of funds were confiscated in a sense. I, uh, I, don't, I don't think that many people understand it, but I do think that this is a point where it's, it's worth <laughs> at least trying, I guess, to be humble and to be patient. Um, the, the reason I think that most people don't get it is not you know, because they're stupid or, or ignorant or anything like that. It's that for most people, at least most, probably most of the people here, most people in, you know, I live in the UK, I spend a lot of time in the US, um, money works really well there. And you do have to give fiat credit for that. And, and not just kind of coincidentally, it's not like, oh wow, you know, even given all these flaws, it, somehow it still works and people don't mind. You, you should give credit for why it has developed in this way. So actually everything, I won't, again, this could be a far, far longer answer. I'll give it very quickly. Everything I went through with self-referentially mispriced toxic loans, that wasn't, that historical development was not malicious. That wasn't a bunch of bankers sitting around thinking, oh, how can we screw people even more than we're already screwing them? Um, every step in the development was basically in some or other way intended to aid commerce. Um, and, and it did. And we're at a point now where, you know, for most people, money isn't even really physical. Like cash is kind of a, almost an anachronism. It's a bit weird. You know, you go through your life viewing your money on a screen, really, and then paying with a piece of plastic, which for the most part is great. That's a lot more, like people, people haven't been tricked into doing that. They want to do that. I do that. I pay for almost everything with a credit card. Probably shouldn't, but you know, I still do. Um, but um, I forgot exactly where I was going with that. Is it, oh yeah, um, 
people not getting it. Um, it takes something like Russia uh, for people to start to wake up, or it takes you know the um, confiscating the bank accounts of the Canadian truckers. Uh, there will be a lot more things like that. Um, but yeah, I think you you have to. Th this is one where you shouldn't just yell at people and mock them. You should appreciate why they have never thought about this because they haven't ever had to think about it, and that in itself is kind of a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing until it's suddenly not a good thing. But for most people, it's a good thing. All right, I guess we'll wait and see. Um, okay, so that's the cheesy part. Uh, Bitcoin is gravity, right? Uh, which is basically you, you're, you're stating that at some point, you know, people, like, because today, basically what people buy Bitcoin with is with their fiat and with their time, right? They earn it, uh, they, they, they convert their fiat into Bitcoin, but you're making this reference that at some point, uh, people will start uh, actually selling their real estate um, for Bitcoin. Uh, and then when the accumulation drive hits short-term credit, real estate, passive equity, this is when the party will really start. Um, so what, what, what will drive this and when do you expect for this party to start? Is it going to be like, uh, you know, one of those things gradually then suddenly or um, are, are we finally going to catch up to the stock to flow model or? Um, I'm going to just completely ignore the final question you asked because I, I have absolutely no idea. I, I mean, there's people whose entire Twitter personalities are dedicated to, you know, pontificating on that. I, I have no clue. I, I'm not just saying that as a joke. Like, I genuinely have no idea how this transition will happen. I'm just relatively confident it will happen at some point. The interesting thing about uh, exactly the asset classes that you've highlighted here, so short-term credit, real estate, and passive equity, is that they are kind of evidence... Uh, oh, I haven't read this one. Ah, yeah, oh, that's good. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> the fact that they are such large asset classes in the first place is a function of fiat money failing, right? They have been monetized, effectively. They are being treated as money because more sophisticated capital allocators know that money will not store value. So they are using short-term credit, passive equity, and real estate as a proxy for money. And so the answer here is quite simple. It's that Bitcoin is a far better proxy for money because it is money. So back to the first question, is it money? Well, yes, people are using it as money. Not to the extent that you know, I think is coming based on these asset classes likely demonetizing um, but again, it's just a question of whether people realize this yet, and most don't. So it'll happen. Don't worry. All right. Keep waiting for it. Um, <clears throat> okay. So here you say, and I think this is really critical about uh, a lot of the things in Bitcoin in general, kind of like the culture of uh, Bitcoin maxis, and not only, is that Bitcoin will make us lower our time preference. Everybody, everybody, whether we like it or not, this will make us take capital more seriously, nurture, replenish, replenish it, grow it in all its forms. Financial markets, um, the architecture of the internet, and natural resources. So what, what do you mean by, uh, because I'm not sure if everyone understands what, what does low time preference mean, and why would we move to a more low time preference, and why is this a good thing at all? I'm actually not sure I can give that good a definition of time preference off the top of my head. I would say it's, it's, it's basically how you choose to act with respect to time and whether or not... It's funny, I always mix up... <laughs> I have to think about which way around it is, whether low or high is the good one, because it's sort of like not visually obvious, <laughs> at least to me. Low is the good one, though. Um, it's your propensity to resist the urge to consume now and instead save and invest now and consume later. Um, and so why will Bitcoin change that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's pretty simple. There, there probably are a lot of more involved answers you can give. I mean, certainly involving financial markets, say, 
probably natural resources as well. I won't go into that now though, because I think the, the simple answer is just that, again, referring back to what I said before, fiat is itself highly unnatural. Like fiat is the imposition on thinking clearly about this kind of thing. And if, you're, if your only way of storing value, if you're not a sophisticated investor and you can put it into real estate or whatever, if the only obvious way of storing value is constantly losing value, then it perversely becomes rational for you to uh, heighten your time, what's the opposite of lower? Yeah, heighten your time preference um, and consume, even if you don't want to, even if you know you naturally yourself have a low time preference, you would rather consume in the future. It's dumb to because you won't be able to because your money will have lost value by then. And so it's basically removing that. It's not that Bitcoin is anything fantastically new or exciting, at least in this respect. It is in other ways. In this respect, it's just removing these, these perverse incentives and allowing people to behave the way they would actually like to. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So I guess I want to, yeah, I, I, because I'm... This is the last slide we have here, and I would then like to open it up. Uh, so we're getting people involved. Uh, maybe they have questions as well. Um, but beforehand, you know, switching switching gears a bit and talking about DeFi, right? Um, DeFi is like a very very hot topic. People are building um, decentralized finance products because Bitcoin is so boring, right? It's just an asset there. You can send it, receive it, keep it, but that's about it. Whereas on Ethereum or all these other um, you know, platforms, Ethereum being obviously the biggest ones, people are uh, building these new financial applications like uh, exchanges, uh, lending protocols, um, uh, derivatives protocols, all, all kinds of really um, applications are being built on top of Ethereum um, and other projects again. Yet your um, conviction is really that these will not last. Um, and you believe you know, which is a rather contrarian thing, I would say, because I don't really know many people uh, who believe that DeFi will really be built on, on top of Bitcoin. Um, why, why do you think that is the case? And will, will, will this really happen? Because like, it's like, there's not much happening there, really, right? Um, there's an enormous amount happening. It's, uh, it's earlier by necessity. Um, and I, I can obviously tell that you're tempting me to now get into all 48 pages of Only the Strong Survive, which I won't do. People can read that on their own if they, if they um, are feeling a bit masochistic, I guess, if they have a free weekend. Um, the one thing I'll say here, I think this is, a, this is a, a, I guess, a nicer way to put it, a more constructive way to put it, because um, I, I, it's interesting, I don't call myself uh, maxi, but basically everyone else does, and I understand why, so I also don't argue with it. Um, but I, I can I can make a more constructive case than just like yelling shit going over and over again, which would be something like, for every every DeFi application that you're familiar with, I, I have no idea what the you know the average familiarity here is, but it almost doesn't matter. Whatever it is you are familiar with, just imagine that it works and you know its goals are the same whatever you want to achieve with it is the same it's it's just as programmable let's say but it is necessarily fully reserved it can't function in such a way that say uh under collateralizes a loan product or uh rehypothecates that collateral um I think, yeah, I think that's about it. That's, that to me is the, the really exciting promise of really DeFi at all, never mind DeFi on Bitcoin, because if anyone has read Only the Strong Survive, they'll know that I think this anyway, that there is a lot of really exciting things being built on, on DeFi, on, on non-Bitcoin DeFi. Um, but I, I think that that's only really a fair claim from what I would call quite a naive perspective for, for basically two fairly simple reasons. I'll just say what they are, I won't actually go into them. One of them is, this is the, the more obviously maxi point that the infrastructure they're being built on, I don't think will 
last because it's inherently unsustainable. It basically requires external funding uh, to, to stay adequately capitalized. Um, so that's number one. Uh, but the more interesting one and where there is more of a natural kind of a constructive point to make is that it's, um, it's not well conceived of as finance. It's, it's lost sight of what the point of finance actually is. And it's more interested in building something cool, like manipulating value in a cool way. Because, I mean, the ability to program value at all is a very, very new thing. And I'm, I'm using that expression generously to not just refer to Bitcoin. Like, obviously, this other stuff is valuable. It has hundreds of billions of dollars of capitalization. But I feel like the majority of the people involved with it are more interested in the novelty of manipulating digital value than the relevance or the the real world use case. Solving real problems, Solving real problems is what George is saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's where this link is to be made because for every real problem that finance ought to solve, it is completely insane to endlessly rehypothecate value or to under or like massively under collateralize and you know all the all the things I was criticizing before and when this stuff happens on Bitcoin it it, it just won't be like that. It'll be impossible for it to be like that. Why why so? Why so? Well, what, what, what's different building it on top of Bitcoin than on top of uh, Ethereum say? That nobody would lend their Bitcoin to something that is undercapitalized. It's really more about, it's not a technical point I'm making, it's a social point. It's that a lot of this stuff happens in non-Bitcoin DeFi in the first place because it's kind of, it's a very, uh, I don't know, I, I, I don't want this to sound critical just for the sake of it, but it's like a buyer beware environment, right? It's, the, it's very, it's like the Wild West. I don't mean that in a bad way necessarily. You could mean it in a bad way. Um, but I think the people involved who are actually providing the value that's being manipulated are very naive about how it's being manipulated and what they intend to get by it. I, I think that they are very willing to see it completely wiped out, which I would argue is inevitable in every case in the long enough run, if they can maybe also see it go up 100x. But Bitcoiners don't really have that attitude. It's, they obviously would like it to go up 100x, but it's far, far more important that you don't lose it. Okay, and um, one sec, what do I have here? Yeah, actually what I wanted to say, one thing I, I really like about uh, your description, which makes sense to me, though I'm not an engineer, but basically one point you're making, and I've seen you know, what you shared with me, other people make, is that, you know, first of all, you're saying, I guess it, ether is not money, and that's why you can't really have money, uh, like you can't have DeFi on top of it, right? Uh, or not? I mean. Yes, but I didn't. Ex yes, but I didn't explain that at all right now. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna get into it because I've read the the fifty page thing. That's why. Um, but okay, uh, no, the, the 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 idea I had in mind, what I really liked, is basically you're saying Ethereum is basically you have this single layer where you have this so much complexity, yeah, yeah. right? You have you have the money, you have the web tree, you have the smart contracts, you have the all this computation happening, and now they're moving to e ETH 2.0, which is going to add even more complexity on top of it, when supposedly, I guess, August, right? Okay. Uh, so, and it's all in this single layer, complexity on top of complexity. And from an engineering standpoint, it's getting more and more likely that something might just break or not work at some point. Whereas Bitcoin is like, the base layer is just super simple, boring transactions. You send, receive, you store, that's about it. And then you can build other layers on top of it, like Lightning, like Liquid, um, which are absolutely independent. And even if they completely fail, um, you know, Bitcoin just continues, doesn't care. Whereas if something of the new stuff on either fails, this potentially, you know, creates a threat for the whole Ethereum ecosystem. Which has happened, right? The, the, the DAO hack and the fork and yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, just very quickly on this, because um, I'm remembering the conversation that we had that led to this. Th this, what George is referring to, isn't my point at all, so I don't really want to talk about it that much, because I'll probably butcher it anyway. 
If anyone is interested in this line of reasoning, I strongly, strongly encourage you to go to YouTube and watch Ryan Gentry and Drew Bansal's talk from last year's Bitcoin conference, from the 2021 conference in Miami. It was, in my opinion, the I think I've seen all of them later, obviously, but um, I think it was the best. I think it was the best by far. Um, and they're, they're interestingly similar to me, I think. Think. I mean, I don't mean to speak for them too much, but I think people would call them maxis. I don't think they would call themselves maxis, and it's very, it's very generous. It's not, you know, they don't use the word shitcoin. They, they make a very clear, logical case, and it ends with a plea to crypto developers to consider bringing their project to Bitcoin. Um, and most of my thoughts, even in the book, I actually, it's, uh, I like this talk so much that it is the only. I think this is true the only non-book quoted in the book. Um, and this is where we're making this point. All right. Um, so, good stuff. So I don't want to take more of, more of the time here. What, this was basically what we had plans, uh, planned in terms of uh, questions. Um, would like to open it up beforehand. I just want to say that, um, you know, this was really just a tiny part of like really a tiny part of the book that there's so much happening in this you would think like 300 pages is not that much but like this is not one of those books which you can summarize in three pages just impossible um and and really is that type of book that you don't really um it's not like a story it's not easy to to say sometimes because as i was listening to uh, you know i'm not sure if everyone has understood absolutely everything but it's one of, one, one, one of these books that you really have to kind of go on your own, sometimes even reread, or at least, I don't know, maybe I'm just like not, not smart enough. But, um, but when I reread stuff, I kind of like understand it better. Um, um, and yeah, like I highly encourage people to, to check it out. It's absolutely not an entry Bitcoin. Bulgarian translation when? Probably, probably. We'll work on that. We'll work on that. Uh, <laughs> next year, next year, okay? Like, by the end of next year, maybe. Uh, when ETH2 comes out. Right, right. That's easy. Uh, <laughs> for a halving? Yeah, yeah. That would be actually cool. Yeah, having Pump it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, you can guys order the book, uh, and the cool thing is that uh, part of the proceeds go to support Human Rights Foundation, which, um, uh, you know, Alex Glastein wrote the forward that we read. You can obviously follow Alan on Twitter, um, read his stuff on, uh, on Medium, and something that's actually uh, very cool. I forgot about that. Yeah, it's the book club. Uh, so there, there's this guy, you probably know him, I, I don't know him personally, but he started a book club on Twitter. So every Saturday they have, um, there's like a, a Twitter spaces where they discuss uh, every single chap, you know, one, uh, chapter one by one. Um, so, oh, yeah. One more, sorry, one more thing to say on this that uh, w we, I think, collectively are very sorry we didn't have copies here that we could sell to you. Um, it's really hard to get the book in Bulgaria. I'm, re I'm sorry about that. Um, in advance, I guess, probably for most of you. So therefore, I mean, try if you want. I just, I suspect if you go to that link, it'll be absolutely absurd shipping fees. In, I think about two months, I forget the exact timing, roughly that, there will be a completely free version um, that I'll just release as a PDF. So currently you, you can get it as a, a, an ebook or maybe just on Kindle. Um, that was only true as of about a week ago, I think. But there will be a completely free version that you can just download and read whenever you want pretty soon. So don't, just in case anyone goes to this link and then is very sad and then never thinks about it again, try to remember that. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and I, yeah, I just wanted to say, so I prepared this uh, because, um, yeah, so Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin is, Venice is not really an entry-level book, I would say. Uh, and also for the recording, since we're doing this, I would say, you know, uh, the Bitcoin standard, the fiat standard, price of tomorrow, uh, there's these two more books that I've written there, are lay a very, very fundamental base on top of which one can then consume Bitcoin is Venice and really appreciate it and, and understand and 
you know, um, see into the future, right? Uh, <laughs> get a sneak peek. Um, so uh, that's really about it, what we had prepared. I guess uh, time for uh, questions. Uh, how it's going to work, I'm not sure. Uh, is the cable long? Just shout. Yes, please. <laughs> or come here, okay. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I really don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank, uh, you know, Alan and uh, George to be so humble and, you know, do this, uh, you know, presentation talk, you know, for us. And uh, one, of, one of the points which I, you know, read, you know, heard, you know, recently, and they did just touch a point, but I, I'm not sure, you know, if everybody understand it, but uh, Bitcoin is a hedge against, um, you know, s such a situations which we have now, maybe in Ukraine or Russia, when all of your funds, you have funds, but you don't, you don't have access to it. So ultimately, this, this is a hedge to such a situations. And uh, I, I really strongly believe that this is uh, uh, very valuable. And uh, I don't know, this is probably you know, for, for the, the, the time which we're living in right now is, is, is a huge thing. So uh, apart from you know, the price or everything else, this is you know, one of the things which you can use. And uh, I just want to encourage everybody you know, to read you know the the books you know the bitcoin standard the bitcoin is venice and uh and i'll do uh my very best you know to make george to translate you know bitcoin is venice you know before the next happening because if we do it in the next happening maybe maybe too too late you know thank you very much um, yeah i guess you can just shout she was first she was first Yeah, that is that is a really good question, and it's a it's another point where I think Bitcoiners just have to own this. You can't be like, ah, it's fine, doesn't matter, because uh, it does it does matter a lot. It's a bit weird that I think I'm right in saying that it's Sailor and or MicroStrategy has is it maybe one percent of all the Bitcoin, something like that, or maybe it's maybe it's one tenth of one percent. It's a ridiculous amount of you know, what you might think will be all the money in the world. Is it 1%? Half. Half, okay, half a percent. Um, yeah, so like right kind of order of magnitude. Um, I also think though that at the same time as, okay, yeah, you have to admit it, you can't pretend it's a good thing. There's also absolutely nothing you can do about it. So, I mean, other than buy Bitcoin. <laughs> That's, oh no, that's it, that's what you should do. Buy more Bitcoin and then it'll, that's how you fix it. Um, no, no, but seriously, there's, it's, it's part of its inherent apoliticalness, um, its uncensorability that you can't create a more, you know, quote unquote, just monetary policy that will fix this problem. So I, yeah, I don't really know where that leaves me. It's like, you should be worried about it. Or well, maybe you shouldn't be worried. You should acknowledge it is not ideal. You should also acknowledge there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. I don't know if I can say anything intelligent about how it will be fixed. Um, I'm tempted to say something like, on the, in the very, very long run, it just will fix itself because people will spend. And I guess maybe one thing to be hopeful about, although I mean, this is probably like after we're all dead, is that it will fix itself in such a way that the same problem will not be recreated. Because from this start, or from any starting point, I guess, I mean, you could even, you could look at like from 2010 when it was way, way worse than now, right? From any starting point, it will only from that point on change on merit. 
it won't get worse. Uh, and it certainly won't get worse through political means, which is exactly the problem we have now that we're trying to solve. That feels like a good point to end, given I just made all that up. And also, I guess uh, the distribution is probably not much worse than fiat first, oh, in the yes. first place. And the distribution is definitely not worse in any other cryptocurrency. No, no it, is, it is way, well, you, it depends what you mean by worse. I mean, you, it's a bit simplistic. I'm certainly not endorsing what I'm about to say. I'm just saying one could make this observation. It's Gini coefficient is horrific. However, it's Gini coefficient has improved every single year of its existence. And I don't actually know this for sure, but I wouldn't be in the slightest surprised if it is improving at a faster rate than any fiat currency, which maybe lends itself to the point I was making there that it will, it's not great, but it will work itself out. Yeah, just in case anyone didn't hear that, this is a really, really good question. So if Bitcoin is so different, why is it so highly correlated with traditional, uh, I guess you mean like the S&P, something like that, right? Or just yeah. traditional financial markets. Um, I don't think I actually know the answer. To, uh, probably nobody knows the answer to this, but I have thought about this recently. And I, I have what I think is an interesting point on this. It doesn't lead at all to a prediction, though, sorry. You'll notice this, by the way, in the answers I give. I, I don't want to predict anything ever, because um, I just don't think I have any relevant skill at it. But in this case, and actually, so not just right now, not just in the past like couple of years, where it has kind of obviously been correlated with actually the NASDAQ more than the S&P, but at any point in its history, it's always priced in a really weird way, which is that the people who actually believe in it don't sell, right? which isn't true of literally any other asset. Any other asset, people will sell at the right price, but the people who believe in Bitcoin will not, which means that the price is always a function of the people who only kind of believe in it. And so, which is very weird, if you just like let that sink in. There's no other asset in the world that is priced by people who kind of believe in it. And I guess, I mean, this seems like a reasonable inference that the people who currently kind of believe in it, or don't, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you sure that's not priced by people who really, really believe in it? I'm not sure there is a kind of believe in Dogecoin. You either do or you don't. Right, anyway, I think it's a reasonable inference that the people who currently kind of believe in Bitcoin, or at least most of the people who are putting the most money into it and hence are setting the price the most, are tech investors. I think that kind of makes sense, but I think also that will therefore change because at some point these people will decide they believe in it and then the baton will get passed to someone else. It'll be like, you know, real estate maybe. It'll be all the real estate people who are like, oh, this is actually better. Like real estate's demonetizing, we should put money into this. So um, again, this is another one of, I realized, um, yeah, my predictions are even more specific than, it's not that I don't give them, it's that I do give them, but I tell you I have no idea when it's gonna happen. So that will change, but I don't know when. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So what if the... Are you, are you Satoshi? <laughs> what, what if we find out, what if we find out who Satoshi is? Does that change anything? I think unfortunately, it, well, it depends what you mean. It would be important news. It would probably affect the price in the, ver in the short term. Yeah. I don't think it makes any difference to how anybody would treat it and hence price it in the long run. That's probably the simplest answer. Oh, is, is, that, is that your theory? You're a rogue NSA cryptographer. Uh, truther. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it matters. I mean, in, unless, I don't know, I'm not like, <laughs> I, I have no novel Satoshi theories. So I just leave it at that. By the way, I forgot to say we have uh, presents for the f for the first question. So uh, 
and, and, and it's on a first come, first serve basis. Um, which book do you, do you like? The Fiat Standards in English? The Bitcoin Standard in Bulgarian? I do have this one, so... So you want this? Okay. You, you want the Fiat Standard as well? Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, my wife is here, so you could ask her. Do you want to ask her? Yeah. Did you, did you uh, either view already or? Uh, Amy, are you orange pilled or are you sick of this shit? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I've really struggled with this. I don't think I have a good answer in this at all. It's probably, in my case, due to weird personal circumstances. I don't think this really like generalizes very well, which is just that at this point, all of my friends and family know that this is like my entire life. And I kind of feel like I don't want to burden them. It's like any, any update about my life is about Bitcoin. So <laughs> they don't need more. Um, I might just leave it at that because I, yeah, I don't really have any good, I mean, there, maybe just entirely generally, like, give them the Bitcoin standard. That's a good start. Um, give them the fiat standard too, actually. Hot take, I like the fiat standard more than the Bitcoin standard. Give them that. I actually think, I, I don't, actually, I don't think that is a hot take. I think this has become more or less consensus, at least on Twitter, that um, it makes more sense to read the fiat standard first because people can relate to it because it's sort of, it's, incredibly crude generalization is pointing out what's wrong with everything around them and then the Bitcoin standard opens their eyes to what might be right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have a good technique, sorry. Do you have a good, how have you done it? Uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it's hard, man. <laughs> People are tired of me talking about Bitcoin as well, so. Huh? A question? Uh, so I'm interested in the cultural analogy that, that you're making. First of all, why is it Venice and not Florence? Uh, that's a good question, yeah. And uh, earlier you sort of implied that DeFi is cool. Uh, mm. And Bitcoin maybe is not, even though you didn't say that. Uh, if we assume that today's Medici are the, <laughs> the marketing teams which are sort of putting this artwork out there You've thought about this question a lot. <laughs> You've thought a lot about this question. <laughs> yeah. Um, why Venice, not Florence first? That is a very good question. Um, remember, I did say that the metaphor is not remotely serious <laughs> and it's just romantic. I think there is still a good answer to this. So part of it is what I already said about uh, defense and attack. I like that comparison. Another... I'm trying to remember, I don't think I really say this in the book because I don't shit on Florence as far as I remember. Um, but an interesting historical note to make is that the governance system in Venice was, I do make this point, I just don't make the comparison to Florence. The governance system of Venice was unbelievably complicated to the point where it was basically impossible to game. And there was a lot of really interesting innovations around, uh, yeah, just, government design, um, political process engineering. I don't know if there's a better way of describing it than that, uh, which I think is quite similar to Bitcoin. Um, Florence, on the other hand, was a complete political nightmare. It was not a safe place to be a politician. Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe you compare that to the rest of crypto, I guess. <laughs> it's it's uh, questionable governance versus um, and I think I'm right in saying this, actually. The longest continuous peacetime government in recorded history was in Venice. So hopefully we can hope for something similar in Bitcoin, right? It's all, 
it's all been, all the governance issues have been resolved without violence to date. So I think that's uh, worth um, trying to keep up at least, trying to mimic Venice. And then the second part was, um, you might need to say it again. It was, uh, are the, are the, the... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, can Bitcoin be cool? Yeah, I think so. I think, oh, we changed the slides, unfortunately, but I think the DeFi slide, yeah, if you want to put it back up. Um, I think this is a key to why it can be cool, because there is a lot of incredibly cool stuff coming on Bitcoin. Um, someone have to advertise it. The, yeah, that's true. Um, I think, um, I don't know, that's not really my field. I don't want to... I'm guessing that's your job. <laughs> I don't want to offend you. <laughs> um, I I would like to think. I mean, so I I don't work in any remotely relevant field. So, with that important caveat out of the way, I would like to think it will all advertise itself because it's just going to be so awesome. But I guess probably everyone who doesn't work in advertising thinks that, right? Like everyone thinks advertising doesn't work on them. My wife works in advertising, and I don't think it works on me. And she tells me I'm an idiot all the time. Right? Yep. She's just nodding. <laughs> yeah, so I have more kind of technical but also economical question. We are also talking about that, uh, that the Bitcoin supply is limited to 21 million. Mm -hmm. That is a good thing. But after approximately, I don't know exactly, but 100 or 120 mm -hmm. years, it won't be any new Bitcoins produced. Mm -hmm. And yeah, even after 50 years, maybe not even 100, we'll start facing these problems that uh, miners won't be that incentivized to support yeah. the network. That's, that's my question, actually. Yeah, hey, it will also get the Litecoin network, but if once the traffic goes there, then the, the main layer, the first layer, won't receive that big amount of yeah. Yeah, yeah. fees. And what do you think will happen? What will yeah. Happen? This is a very good question. I um, I do have quite an involved answer to this, but I want to just preface it by saying that I'm not at all an expert on this. I think there are actually, there are really interesting people. I'd highlight Joe Kelly, most of all, if you're familiar with him, um, as having made, I think, the best, well, it's not exactly a bear case on Bitcoin, but it's a important and well put technical criticism of Bitcoin that any serious Bitcoiner needs to have thought about. You can't just brush it aside. Um, and I owe a lot of my thinking on this to, to him. I do actually disagree with him about this though, but it's important to, to take that kind of criticism seriously. So with that said, my take on this is that it's not something that it's even possible to have a well-formed opinion on now. So the just to, to frame this a bit, more broadly for people who might not be familiar with the problem, every having the um, the automatic block reward halves, obviously, and therefore the minor reward in nominal Bitcoin terms goes down. The hope, it eventually goes to zero in a very long time, but it gets close to zero before that. The hope is that transaction fees make up for that, uh, but for basically the entire existence of Bitcoin, there hasn't really been any precedent for that taking off. However, we are talking about so long away. I mean, you referenced it well in your question. I think that it's probably, I don't know, like 30 to 50 years before it maybe becomes serious. Um, we have absolutely no idea how people are gonna be using Bitcoin in 30 to 50 years. So I think that is the most important starting point in this debate where, and this is where I, my main disagreement with Joe Kelly is that I don't think he acknowledges this. I think he goes straight for, no, it's screwed. Like, here's the math, right? But also people who argue against him do the same. They're like, no, it's not screwed, here's the math. Whereas my point, which I think is like, I honestly think this isn't even a perspective. I think it's just the correct way to think about this is that there is no math. Nobody knows. Um, and it's kind of a non-answer therefore, right? It's like, ah, nobody knows, oh well. That doesn't mean you can't talk about it though, obviously. It's just, I do get irritated in both of those cases where they, they talk about it and they say they know what is gonna happen. So it's, it's perfectly acceptable, I think, to speculate as to why the transaction fees will, or might rather, go up. Sorry, it, it, precisely not that they will go up. Why they might go up or why they might not go up. Um, 
and then my answer becomes really boring because I don't have anything particularly original to say there. Uh, but again, a lot of other people do. So like uh, I'd say I think Gigi in particular has a very good pro case for this, um, which isn't even that complicated. I mean, I don't want to butcher it now, but it's effectively that um, opening and closing lightning channels will fill the demand and there will be a nice equilibrium between the cost of, uh, or equilibrium isn't exactly the right word, there'll be a dynamic between the cost on Lightning and then switching to the main chain if that becomes too expensive, but that then directly supports transaction fees. So I'd encourage you to look into that. Look into that, look into Joe Kelly. I have nothing interesting to say other than be humble. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is part of, of GG. I mean, it's not just GG, obviously, but um, that is part of the lightning argument that you would do it out of necessity and they would be enormously patched. So to you, it would be minimal. But in aggregate, the on-chain transaction would be a hefty fee. Yeah. But I, again, I'd, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay, because you mentioned more about the trends and attack and you see into the trends, but yeah, I was yeah, thinking if it's related to that as well. Yeah, it's partly related to that. I mean, that, um, again, I've said this a few times, but just to really emphasize it, that chapter and hence the title of, the, with that section of the chapter and hence the title of that chapter and hence the title of the book is like not at all serious. And it's only maybe two or three pages of a list of equally unserious reasons Bitcoin is Venice. And that's one of them. But they have nothing to do with one another. The attack defense thing has nothing to do with the Renaissance. <laughs> Does it have something to do with marketing is the question. Well, I don't know. I don't know anything about marketing. So we'll have to ask someone who does. <laughs> Okay, but you don't get a book. I don't want a book. Wow, wait, what? <laughs> I have the <laughs> Okay, so I would like to open the Pandora's box on venture capital and uh, in, our, yeah, um, in our awesome, awesome space and generally the concept of decentralization and major billions pouring in, let's just say, Web3. So in Q1 only, we have like approximately 15 billion investments, which is quite a hefty amount. So, and what was it? Last week, Anders Horowitz opened a new fund. 4.5. Yeah, 4.5. So that's quite nice. So we have these really, really big dudes with the billions. So what happens with the small investors that crypto is generally supposed to work for? At least in my minds, and mm. at least in some of these guys' minds. <laughs> no, no, not only, not only, because some of us are really excited about investments in our space, and that evolves the space, yes. But at the same time, it yeah, just yeah. Okay, breaks I'm the balance. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Just, but that's an internal <laughs> discussion yeah, yeah. we've been having. No, no, no. I just, just wanted to, to add something. This is not the question. No, no, I know, I know it's, not, it's not a question. I just wanted to add something. Yeah. Sorry. No, I just, just wanted to, to add something that uh, about correlation of traditional assets in Bitcoin. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know, holding Bitcoin and they, they don't sell it. So the, the, one of the reasons why Bitcoin is, is going down is, is liquidity. So th there is not so much liquidity, which is in traditional assets. So your question, you know, getting more assets, you know, more money into the space, just get, just get everything better. That's, that's what I think. And now, Alan can share his point of view. It was not addressed. <laughs> 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 
You sure? Is it okay? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I have anything all that interesting to say on this, to be honest. I, I, in addition to, I made the same point when we had the DeFi slide up that I've said a lot of very angry, sarcastic things about this that I might just kind of leave and people can go find that if they want to. <laughs> it's, I, I don't, I don't want to be too um, aggressive here. Um, I'm not a fan of many of the things you mentioned. I might just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll say it in ten years when uh, it no longer matters as much what these people think of me. <laughs> I told you I'm not a fan. <laughs> I think it's pretty bad. Oh yeah, it's uh, it will be in textbooks as a misallocation of capital one day, if not already. George, I don't have one. <laughs> so the final question back there. Well, what kind of risks? Oh, I have an amazingly snarky answer to this. Okay. Um, I don't because it's meaningless. Is that, I can elaborate if you want. Um, a probability is only meaningful insofar as there exists a, pro a probability density function that either is like actually exists in some objective natural form or that you are inferring from the base rate of some events historical uh, record. We're talking about things that have no historical precedent and so there is an acceptable way of interpreting this there's a, as in there's an additional third way that you can assign some meaning to, to probabilities of essentially uncertain events and not risky ones, uh, which is that what the probability means is what terms you deem to constitute a fair bet. Uh, that would be fine in this case if people were betting on it, but probably most of the people in this room, and certainly me, are not in a position to, in addition, make a bet on it because my entire portfolio is a bet on it. So it's also, and actually as a final point, it's, it's not meaningful if you just say what it is. So I can't just say, oh, I think the fair odds are whatever. You have to actually do it for it to count. And I'm not going to do it because I don't have any spare Bitcoin to do that with. I want them to be Bitcoin, not bets on Bitcoin. So I don't know. It's, I, I don't think the it posed to me. I don't think the question is meaningful. Uh, no, I, I'm not actually 100 percent. No. Oh, I see where you go. Okay, this is clever. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, of course there's a, yeah, of course there is a risk. I'm not denying that there's a risk. I'm denying the utility of putting a number on the risk. Also probably true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well put. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I don't think um, I can be a bit less snarky and say it's not zero percent. It's not a hundred percent. It's it's something in between. I'd be very skeptical of any proposed actual number of the risk. 
I'm only being this snarky because you did start off by <laughs> the, specifically your question was what are what is the probability? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not at all an expert in this kind of thing. Um, I'm not at all worried about a quantum attack. I think that comes from a popular misunderstanding of what quantum computing will achieve if it ever exists in the first place. Um, I think the main thing I'm worried about actually links back to the last question. It's I think the most coherent bear case is Joe Kelly's. I think it's a sustained government empty block, well, it doesn't need to be empty blocks, a, a hash rate attack. That There's a non-negligible risk of that happening. There's non-zero risk of that. Um, most others, I struggle to see, like there are a bunch of other things you could say, like um, I don't know if you know Ben Hunt, uh, he's, not a, like, he's not a Bitcoiner, he's, um, a really good, just kind of regular financial blogger and like Twitter personality, I guess. He has a really, a far more subtle case where it's like, it basically ends up being white listed. As in like usable, it's co-opted by states such that only, um, only uh, coins with a history of which they approve can be used in day-to-day -day life. Um, that's interesting to think about, but I really struggle to see why it would actually come about. It sort of, to me, that makes sense as an end state. Like, if it got to that point, that would be really bad and probably not recoverable. But I don't see how it would. I think the game theory between states is too strong for that to come about. Again, I'd say it's non-negligible, though, yeah. So there are a handful. Yeah, it's definitely not zero. There is risk. There's enormous risk. This is not financial advice. None of this. <laughs> and uh, so, sorry for my previous snarky answer. I just got really excited by the probability question. All right. So um, I think this is it. Two hours into this very philosophical discussion. So I guess thank you all. Please, a warm thank you to Alan Farrington and George. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll give the mic to George for any final words tonight. Yeah, that's all from my side. Yeah, I mean, I uh, hope, <laughs> hope it was interesting, guys. Um, yeah, I, I already pretty much said about it. What else? Did I want to say something? Yeah, just follow on, read our stuff, uh, get deeper into Bitcoin, ask critical questions, spread the word, uh, because uh, I mean, what we're what we're talking about here is really, I personally believe the the future of humanity, and that's why I really insisted on reading this uh, introductory um, preface, uh, because there's a lot at stake, and we don't necessarily recognize it. We talk about prices and shit, and you know, salary and stuff, but that's not really, at the end of the day, what matters. Um, and so, yeah, it's important. It's probably one of the most important things ever. It's just people don't know it because they don't take the time to understand it. So that's it. Um, thanks, thanks, Alan, as well, for taking Thank the time you. here. Um, and I guess we can just uh, mingle around. People can ask questions. So the next event will be next month, so uh, there's good three to four weeks until the next event. You'll learn about it in Sofia Crypto Meetup on Facebook, so yeah, have a great evening, guys.